Well, thank you very much for everybody that's dialed in. Um, purpose of tonight is uh, the first of a, a national update uh, that we're running this week. Um, this is on operations, uh, so life-saving first aid. Later this week on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Lewis and others will uh, be running one looking at the COVID protection framework <clears throat> um, and sport and junior surf. That's a, a, a double one. Um, choose your night. Uh, please encourage people to, from your club to to dial into that one. I think that one is going to be particularly interesting because um, we are constantly and currently being updated by Sport New Zealand and government uh, on what that's going to look like. Operations, I think we're fairly comfortable, but we thought this was an opportunity for a national dial in, and we'll do um, we'll do another couple at least before Christmas, just to allow people to. Um, ask questions and feel connected to the national body and I think that's the primary purpose for us tonight is to introduce you to some of the national staff and for us to hear directly from the coalface um, how's it going do you have any questions um, can we do things better for you answer any um, any big queries so just um, a bit of etiquette I've asked everybody to turn their um, screens off just to allow us to um, to help those with a poor internet connection, which includes me living out in the sticks. Um, staff at the moment have got their connections on. Um, please put your name and your club um, in the chat function and, um, and who you are representing, that'll be useful. Um, which club and also what role you have in that club, just for, um, so we understand who's, who's here. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. So for those that aren't happy with that, now's the time to leave. But we thought we'd record it and potentially um, put it on the web for others to see as well, or share it, share it in some way. Uh, quick introduction. So um, I'm Adam Muller. I'm the uh, Chief Operations Officer. Um, and on the call with us tonight, we have Andy Kent, the National Life Saving Manager. There he is. Um, we've got uh, Chris Emmett the National Club and Volunteer Development Manager. Uh, we have Dr. Gary Payinder. Gary is our Medical Director. We've got Paul Newnham. Uh, he's waving there. He's our new COVID Support Manager. Uh, thank God for Paul. He's <coughs> been a godsend in the last, um, in the last week. Um, we've got uh, regional staff, James Lee, from South Lake Saving Northern Region, the operations manager. We've got uh, it's Chris Jeffrey somewhere in the background. Chris, I think, is here. He's the regional life saving manager for the Southern Region. We've got Stu, um, Stu Bryce, the regional manager from the Southern Region, making a guest appearance. Uh, we've got Chaz Gibbons Campbell having his dinner, he said. Uh, so he's not on screen, but he's the regional life saving manager from the Eastern Region. And we've got the very lovely Tim Gibb um, from the central region. Thanks for phoning in and dialing in, guys. So what I'm going to do is um, hand over to Andy Kent, the National Life Saving Manager, who may or may not uh, have some questions that have already been um, emailed in. Um, Andy's going to give a little update on the world, according to, uh, to us, in terms of life saving. And um, then Gary's going to hand over to Gary, who's going to talk about first aid and um, resuscitation and medical stuff. And then really, we'll open the floor up. And then when we do, we want people to, if possible, put the questions through the chat function. Uh, but if, it need, if need be, we can always turn the cameras on and have a, a proper one-to-one -one conversation. So that's, that's the, the format for tonight. We haven't set a time limit. We can stay as long as you need us to, to answer all your questions. But again, thank you for taking the time to dial in tonight. Andy. Thanks, Adam. <coughs> Hopefully everyone can, can hear me. Yep. Yep, good, good. So uh, yeah, as, as Adam said, I'm the, the National Life Saving Manager. I think um, it's, Great to see you know, so many people on. Um, we had a couple of regional calls uh, around August, I think, too, and that was um, really good conversations around uh, any, any queries clubs had um, or, or anything 
um, which was brought up, which we could probably uh, see coming um, in the future, which which helped us as a staff as well. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes out tonight. I haven't had any questions come through uh, my emails, and I spoke earlier to Gary, and I don't think he had either, but um, we'll see. But I think um, this, this, from our point of view, uh, Northern Region obviously has already been patrolling um, since Labor Weekend in um, Alert Level 3. And as we all know, um, on Friday, the alert levels disappear. So um, what does that mean in terms of lifeguarding? Well, well really, <laughs> it actually gets arguably a little bit easier. Um, the uh, alert level two is generally about the same as, as the, the new um, traffic light red. So a lot of restrictions actually come off. So we are in a pretty good space, I think, because of um, the, the clubs which have already been patrolling in, in alert level three um, with all the protocols and the documents which we've had in place. Um, and they're all on, the, obviously, the CFI 7 New Zealand website. Um, I presume everyone's had a really good read of those. But I think the, the so the message really um, hasn't changed from from what was discussed in uh, in August and, and really the whole way along, um, is club operational plans are still really, really important. And it's really important that clubs know their members, um, that yeah, your ability to patrol um, on how many lifeguards you have, especially after January 1, um, when the, the um, vaccine mandate from Surfly Save New Zealand rolls into effect. So that's really our, um, our key message is from a club point of view, just understand um, your, your membership, understand how you are going to patrol um, and work with your regional officers to um, work through your club operational plans. And, that, and that's things like, um, even though uh, originally, um, and James is on the call, so he might pop in later and, and offer some advice, but um, yeah, bubbles of, of less than of 10 was, was sort of the, the, the patrolling way at the start of, of alert level three. Now, um, even though the restrictions have, have come off, um, or will come off in, in the traffic light system, it's whether or not your club still think that's a good idea. To actually, to unneedlessly to have 25 people on patrol, um, where we're possibly on a weekend um, where it might be raining or, or it, um, you're not expecting big numbers, to actually try and bring those numbers down so we're not um, exposing more people, uh, potentially if there is a, a COVID outbreak in your community, um, to, to have unnecessary people on patrol. That's the type of things now which I think in our club operational plans which, is, which still need to be discussed at, at, uh, at a local level. Um, of course, the, the advice which Gary has, um, has put out, um, it's now the SOPs, uh, now there's two SOPs in, in, in play, um, for uh, one for rescue guidelines and the other one for emergency care guidelines are still very, very relevant. And will be relevant, I believe, right through um, whatever happens, even with this new variant which comes through. So, really, that, that's all um, I have to say. Um, I think there might be some other discussions which come out of out of tonight, which which could help us um, or Paul uh, Newman <laughs> uh, change, obviously, our, um, uh, our dashboard, our, our um, compliance document which has served us really, really well. That compliance document has been a godsend really to help us direct and give guidance out. Obviously on Wednesday, on Friday, sorry, that becomes irrelevant. So we're in the mix of, of, of changing that up now um, with a lot of different advice and a lot of different templates from, from different um, government avenues around what we should do. We had a really good meeting this morning around how we um, factor that in around, uh, you know, maybe a bit more Elite level three, this is how you patrol rather than combining it all into, into one matrix. We want to try and keep it simple. Um, Paul's a good man and, and it's great to have someone who's dedicated from Surf Lifesaving to focus solely on, on COVID for the moment. But um, I'll hand over to Gary uh, if he's got any other, question, uh, any other questions.
questions which have come through his emails, but um, you yeah, happy to, to talk further um, and answer any questions which come up. Great, thanks for that. Does, um, if anyone has any questions, um, just fire them away. I'm gonna spend maybe two minutes giving you my kind of worldview of COVID risk for lifeguards. And then um, I'd like to tailor this to whatever your needs are. Um, I, I want us to have a, a conception, like a shared mental model for what COVID risk is and, and what it isn't. Um, COVID is, you, you can safely assume that any interaction you have with a colleague or with a patient could potentially give you COVID. Um, the things that increase its risk are prolonged indoor close contact with someone. So um, for that reason, study after study has shown that even among healthcare workers, the greatest risk is from a person's own family and close social contacts. So your chance of getting COVID is far greater from the people you hang out with and work with than from the patient you're going to rescue or the lifeguard that you're going to um, work next to. Um, likewise, uh, most of you won't be doing resuscitations on patients every day or any, or even once a year. And so the risk you need to keep in mind is the risk of colleagues and, um, and coworkers and friends um, spreading it to you. So if the risk is predominantly one of social spread within indoor prolonged contact environments, you have to look to the places that are high risk, the lifeguarding tower, the, the room that you sleep in, the bunk room that houses people overnight, um, the kitchen where you're going to let your guard down, take your mask off and hang out with people, and the sofas and the, 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 the sort of living room of the, of the clubhouse and, and meetings and parties. Time after time, the studies and are showing us that the super spreader events are not of, of patients spreading it to us. It's of uh, lifeguards spreading it to each other um, through social interactions. So if you don't want to get COVID and, and you don't for reasons of hospitalization, death, um, which are, are going to be rare for young, healthy people, but also for long COVID, for clotting in your lungs, for um, breathlessness that lasts beyond four months. Um, which happens in a fair number of um, COVID survivors, um, then you want to take a few steps. And, and those steps are very, very simple. Masks, vaccination, and ventilation. So um, any mask is a good mask. If, if the alternative is between you taking your mask off um, and you wearing a, a comfortable cloth one that you can keep on you know, um, for prolonged periods, one that you like, one that you think looks okay and is comfortable, go with the more comfortable cloth mask over the more effective medical mask, which are the blue, i.e. surgical masks, um, or, or other varieties of masks. We know that the blue ones, the surgical masks, are, are, are more effective, significantly more effective, but the simple masks are good enough. The main point is actually wearing one and not forgetting. Uh, and that step alone, if you just do two things, one is you put a mask on every patient you see immediately, um, and you wear one yourself when you are in close proximity to others, or certainly when you're indoors, um, while there's COVID going around in the community, then you've already done a, yourself a massive favor in terms of reducing your risk. Um, vaccination should, should be a foregone conclusion. Um, it's going to be required for all lifeguards. Um, but beyond that, it reduces your risk of becoming hospitalized by about 90% and reduces your risk of dying by about 90%. So the risk of dying is obviously age related. If you're an 85 year old male, your death risk is something on the order of one in 10. If you're a 20 year old, it's probably on the order of one in 20,000 to one in 100,000, the risk of death. So it's incredibly unlikely that you would die. But I wanna emphasize that the, the worry is not really of death. It's of um, long-term or chronic symptoms from COVID. So COVID causes um, dysfunction and clotting within your heart um, and your lungs, especially. And those after effects in, in, in someone who's been hospitalized, there's demonstrable scarring in the lungs um, after hospitalization in 40% of, uh, of patients. And those are the ones that left the hospital and, and you know, survived and were okay. Um, there's still gonna be quite a bit of, um, of uh, lung disease there. 
And certainly, even in people who never end up in hospital, five to 10% will have prolonged decrease in exercise function, uh, exercise tolerance. Um, and by prolonged, I mean, four to six months, we don't know like years and years, but, but we do know the, um, the four to six month period is, uh, has persistent symptoms. So you don't want to get it. You wear masks, you, you put them on patients. Um, you, this is, I guess, good advice for, um, the group of you who sort of set the tone for your clubs. Make sure the ventilation in your clubs is good. Make sure that it's explicit that people understand that we do everything outside that we can under a, a shade shaded area, under a shade sale or something like that. We do our teaching, our nippers, our working on motors, our whatever it is, anything that can be done outside, seeing patients, treat them outside. I'm not going to bring them back into my club's first aid, tiny, uh, poorly ventilated, enclosed bank space. Um, to st sit with them for a prolonged period of time. That just makes no sense whatsoever, regardless of who they are, uh, even just hanging out. You don't want to be in indoor spaces if you can avoid it. So we're going to do everything outside that we can, only coming in if we need to. And we're going to put masks on the patient and ourselves. We talked about that. And we're going to have through ventilation. So doors open, windows open um, as much as possible. There's there's few excuses for good ventilation, at least in Northland. No reason not to have um, a good, good breeze. And we're going to acknowledge that our risk is more from our peers and the indoor setting than anything else. Um, yeah, masks, vaccination and ventilation. Um, and your risk will be as minimal as you can make it. Whether we are talking about Delta, um, Omicron, um, pandemic flu influenza, which we, we may get or anything else. This is common advice for any respiratory infection, and it will stand you in good stead. I don't think you need to be paranoid about this thing if you do the smart things correctly. Um, I did want to take questions, so I'll go to that in one second. And I did want to recommend that for all, all of you clubs who are like looking for some discrete specific guidance, make sure everyone has that my vaccine pass so that you have a scannable quick release, a quick um, the word for it, you know, the, 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 the QR code um, available. Uh, do this work ahead of time. Don't end up surprised um, by, let's say, vaccination requirements or ventilation requirements or what have you um, a month from now. Um, make sure your people are well informed of how they access things like the My Vaccine Pass. Make sure you have a ventilation plan that you've discussed how you're not going to uh, have multiple lifeguards sitting in a a poor, uh, poorly ventilated small space um, without windows open, without some awareness um, of not being in groups. And mask advice, review what Adam and others have put out regarding masks. Um, I have a printout of it, just kind of giving you some guidance. It was based on the levels, um, but suffice it to say, the levels don't matter much. You, I want you to treat every patient, every colleague, as if they are a risk to you, especially when you're indoors in close proximity and you do things to minimize um, your exposure, your exposure time, and, and try to maximize your masking and ventilation. Um, if you do those things, I, I don't think you need to be um, particularly worried. Um, now, there's always a baseline risk that all of us will have living and working in the community. What we want, what I want, is that your experience at your club will not put you at increased risk of getting COVID. Um, you'll have enough risk, in, as I say, among your peers and in your regular life. We don't want the, uh, the gathering place of the surf club to be an additional risk to you. And with good masking, vaccination and ventilation, it won't be. So that's, that's it for um, kind of how I think about this risk. Uh, I'm happy to take questions from anyone, if, 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 uh, unless Adam wants to go to the next speaker. No, no, um, I can Gary, do it in any old way. A first question has come in on the chat uh, to you. Let me let me see how do I. How it says, do, I do you strongly my... do you strongly recommend mask wearing by lifeguards in an ATV based on close physical contact with the room, regardless okay. of an outdoor activity? Beautiful question. So um, that's great. I consider your risk of getting um, a respiratory infection, uh, COVID or, or, or another, um, to be trivial in the outdoor setting. Um, if we're talking about an enclosed vehicle, like a 
a Hilux Ute, completely different story. Now that's the opposite of what I've been talking about. That's enclosed, close proximity, stale air. That's what you don't want. Um, the only way you can make that worse is by having multiple people in there all rebreathing the same air. So that's that's a greenhouse for uh, for spreading respiratory infection. Um, on an open like side by side or like ours, which just has a, a windscreen essentially on a beach, uh, the risk in in my professional opinion is trivial. Oh, I should give some some background of who I am just so because maybe not all of you know of me or uh, anything. I'm an emergency doctor. I sit. Um, uh, representing SURF uh, on the New Zealand Resuscitation Council. Um, and I do work uh, part-time on a rescue helicopter um, in Auckland. Um, and I'm the medical director for SURF Life Saving New Zealand. So that's my background. And, and I do some writing on um, science and medical topics as well. Um, your risk in the outdoor setting is not zero, but it's minimal. And uh, experience bears that out. Uh, there haven't been the kinds of spread in in the outdoor settings that that we uh, might have thought. Even when people aren't masked and aren't behaving safely and are doing everything wrong, there still is much less risk than we would think. Where the risk is from these outdoor events is when you choose to come inside. So the most dangerous thing is not you in the side by side; it's you going to have some beers after. Uh, a weekend of, of patrolling and hanging out with people inside, watching some TV, that for, you know, hours, that is your risk. Um, these quick, brief, transient interactions in open air are of, of trivial risk. Now, if you um, want to wear a mask in that setting, I'd absolutely encourage it. Our guidelines are tailored to a responsible person with a modicum of self-preservation and some intelligence to allow them to wear masks when they think it's appropriate. So if I have to be in close proximity to someone, I may well choose to wear a mask like in that side by side, but I want you to understand in terms of risk, it's trivial. But the second you go inside to hang out and and again, have a, have a drink or have a barbecue with, with folks indoors, your risk is, is completely in a different realm, orders of magnitude higher. Um, likewise, people, really worry about like the rescue part of it. Oh, I've got to get up close to this person and drag him out and, and do all of this. In the open air, your risk is trivial. Once you're in that enclosed environment with multiple people, poor ventilation, completely different story, but um, there's nothing I would consider uh, being moderate or high risk in the outdoor setting. Gary? Um, yeah. Yes. And how do you go about who isn't very favorite in their notes? I don't know if that's just me, but you're no. quite broken for that one. Yeah, I'll read it. Gary's another question which has come through. Um, how do you go about treating a patient who isn't vaccinated? Do we record this in our notes? Okay, that's a wonderful question. You treat them the same as the patient who is vaccinated, the same as the lifeguard next to you. Everyone in the community is a COVID risk, um, assuming COVID is spreading in your community, which, you know, it's popping up in communities all around the place. So it's safe to assume that everyone's a risk. Um, for a while, uh, people were interested in, in trying to ask questions to figure out if people are high risk, but um, the, it's not a very useful um, function. What you want to, to do is treat everyone as a risk. So that patient immediately gets a mask and you will wear a mask because you can't maintain any kind of distancing from them um, if you're in, intimately involved in, let's say, a recess or a first aid. So yeah, they, they, get, um, they get masked and you treat them as if they were unvaccinated, even if they are vaccinated, because vaccinated people can still get it. We know that the vaccine reduces your uh, uh, transmissibility to others around you somewhere around 50% mark. Um, but still, that's not perfect. So always assume that the person, the people around you are a threat. And again, I'd, I'd not focus on the patient if I were you. I would actually um, consider the colleagues that you'll be spending six, seven, eight hours with um, as being the actual source of more risk. Did that answer that question, Andy? 
Yeah, I think so. That, that's also included in the um, in the in the two insops. So if you had a, a patient who walked up with burnt feet, arguably to your surf club to um, to request um, first aid treatment, um, it's very you know you haven't uh, pulled them out of the water or anything like that. You'd treat everyone the same as as Gary said. It's it's in that in, insop under Gary's uh, advice. Um, Lewis has come through a uh, question for our email. If the COVID, if the risk is COVID, how are surf life saving New Zealand ensuring that COVID isn't present at an event? Okay, I've opened up the chat now. At an event, of course. Okay, shouldn't we be mitigating the risk of COVID itself? How do we ensure COVID isn't present at an event? You can. Uh, you can safely assume that COVID is present at an event. If there are masses of people and there's at least a modicum of community spread in, in your area, then just assume that there's COVID at that event. Encourage people there to wear masks. You wear your mask. You maintain your distance. You do everything outside that you can, i.e. ventilation. Um, and you make sure you're vaccinated, even if the rest of the world isn't, you are. Um, those are the best things you can do to reduce risk. Asking people questions about have you been in MIQ, have you traveled here, have you done that, are you vaccinated or not, will give you a false sense of security. It's uh, when those people answer negative to those questions, it does not mean that you are safe from them. Um, and the reason that we in hospital settings, St. John or, or in my ED or whatever, the reason we ask those is that so we can more effectively cohort people. We can put you in a COVID area, a COVID side of the ED, a COVID ward, but we all know that our risk comes just as much from the green side, which is the safe side, the COVID free side, as it is from the ones who are COVID risks. Um, the reality is we can get it on either side and should be wearing masks and being careful on both sides. Gary, just um, I don't think there's any more questions coming through. What would be your advice? Um, and maybe this is sort of a bit more conversation with um, with Paul and and, and uh, Chris Emmett too, around uh, how do we articulate out to clubs, other than or do should we be articulating more than the government advice already around if you're feeling sick stay at home, get tested around our patrols. Do we need to, should we be also including that in our um, advice out to clubs, which is which is just a basic health advice, but should we be putting that in a, in a reminder for, especially if you're feeling sick or unwell, not to patrol? Um, it's interesting. I, I would take it for granted, and probably we shouldn't do this, but I would take it for granted that during a worldwide pandemic, if you had respir infectious respiratory symptoms, a cough, a cold, fever, chills, muscle aches, that you would have the common etiquette or common courtesy to not expose uh, the rest of your colleagues to that infection, uh, whether it's a cold flu, uh, meningococcemia, or, or COVID. Um, so I would like to think that people would self-isolate at home while they're acutely symptomatic um, if they can't do that, I think it's a demonstration that they're not probably that responsible in assessing risk. These are probably people who make bad uh, decisions about risk and bad judgments. Um, I understand there's the pressure, like among doctors and nurses, there's always the pressure. If I go home, the rest of the shift will suffer. Um, they've got to cover. But for the past year, um, we've uh, certainly adapted our um, process and we strongly encourage people who appear a bit under the weather to leave and to leave now um, and go take care of themselves, get tested, and then come back uh, when they're both feeling better and they test negative. So I hope that answers that question. If we need to put that sort of stuff in a policy, um, then, then we should. Uh, maybe it's helpful for someone to read that. Um, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Do you think it's necessary to... Uh, to give people that sort of advice, I suppose it couldn't hurt. Well, I think it's just whether or not, uh, you know, how, how that disseminates better from a, from a national point of view or from a, that's why I think club, well-communicated club 
um, plans from clubs to members, I think is again, really, really key. Um, there is another question coming through. Um, can a lifeguard sign a waiver disclaimer that waives health and safety responsibility of the club for that individual member? Uh, I, I don't know. The, the management can answer these questions from a legal basis, but from, from my experience, you cannot uh, abrogate or surrender your health and safety um, responsibilities. Uh, you cannot enter into a, a bargain or a contract where you knowingly expose people to increased risk uh, of harm. So I don't think you can be absolved from your legal responsibilities by signing away a piece of paper. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the waiver would precisely say, um, but I think we have an obligation to do what is sort of reasonable and appropriate, um, and, and the lifeguards do as well. Um, they should be entering into th these arrangements in good faith. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I try and understand a bit more about that question from whoever? Genoese. Genoese, uh, can, you yep. can you elaborate? Oh, we've just, it's, uh, I'm Andrew from Levin Water Area. We just had a oh, right. mem member who's yeah, just asked, ask that question they're just i guess challenging our challenging the the vaccination policy oh um, and, we, and, and we've sort of yeah. spread it right across the 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 um the club so they're just challenging challenging that our, our responses as you have provided there but i just wanted to get a second second point a second opinion on it no no that so the answer is no, no uh, the, the, it's not not a logical thing uh for them to do nor for you as a club to 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 go down that route of accepting it's like him it's like someone saying we you know is it would it be okay to exempt me um from doing something wrong um as long as i don't have to take my irb exam and i can drive the irb around like a maniac and uh, and run over the top of people um but i'll sign a form to say that i, I you know that you won't be held responsible well you would so you wouldn't do it same thing not exactly the same thing, but similar principle. Copy that. Yeah, I would say this is the time for clubs to see themselves as part of a national rescue organization with a responsibility towards patients and the public um, that involves, you know, health. Um, and so the person asking these questions, I, I think, should uh, should have a little bit of shame uh, for essentially trying to game a system. Um, there, they should be trying to do what's best for the patient and not trying to get out of, you know, uh, and get an enter into legal um, arrangements that will um, uh, get them away from, from where the thrust of this is going. This is about nothing more than reducing risk to patients and colleagues um, for a vaccine preventable infection um, that right now is having significant morbidity around the, the world. Now, the, the reason I think you're getting a lot of these, these sort of uh, movements and, and question, uh, questions is because people haven't seen the morbidity and mortality, so the harm and the, the damage from it. Um, as we get more cases and more people know um, of, of people who've been injured, uh, I think a lot of this, people will start to understand. And now I think with the Omicron sort of popping up, people are realizing that all this talk of, you know, Freedom Day and when do we get back to normal and, and all of that has to be tempered with reality that, you know, there have been hundreds of thousands of deaths um, uh, with this thing uh, worldwide. Um, and it's going to be a while that we're stuck with it. Uh, and I mean, you know, years. And we better get good at managing risk uh, in, you know, using masks appropriately and distancing and just changing the way we do things so that our risk is reduced. Um, we've got a question. What if the person, this is Sandra B, has a medical exemption and they cannot get a vaccine? Um, I'm happy to take that question. Uh, the number of individuals nationally that have genuine medical uh, necessity to not get the vaccination is fleetingly small. I mean, incredibly rare. 
on the order of maybe a hundred or in the low hundreds of people nationwide out of four and a half million. Um, what the government has done, I think, is is set good, strong guidance for um, a medical exemption, and uh, we're going to follow that. And so, um, people who are trying this on for size with their um, their local health practitioners of all varieties, um, they're going to get told that um, that the medical exemption has to actually be um, legitimate. And so uh, we may ask them to um, go to specialists or uh, certainly to have everything run by uh, my area, the medical director um, for approval. And of, of course, um, uh, we always have um, room for legitimate um, concerns, but most of them will not be medically justifiable at the level of a, a true medical specialist. Uh, assessment. So, yeah, that's that's um, that's where I stand on that. Um, Adam, can you talk to that issue of of exemptions? I mean, the vaccine is is mandatory um, as part of the job function. Is there a bit more you want to say about that? Um, yes, there's there's two things. So, the, did did you cover that? You cover the process. I'm having a bit of dropout now. So, the process the government have put in place for those that sit under the health order, which we believe lifeguards do, is that um, a lifeguard would apply in the first instance to you, Gary, and um, you would assess their application with supporting documentation from their uh, doctor or physician. And then if you were satisfied that they did have a case, it would be submitted to the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Health would make a decision, not us, them. Um, and as you said, the, the tiny percentage, tiny percentage of people. And so, so, just, so the other question they asked is, so if someone does have an exemption, so let's say we, we have someone in our organization who's one of those 100 people, for example, um, would they be allowed to patrol? No, because the because it is the activity of patrolling that requires um the um vaccination not the person as such so um just don't patrol go and do something else that would be the the, the simple simple line so it's, it's um the requirement is for, for the role of lifeguarding end of story yep i think it's worth um talking through the the idea of medical exemption just briefly um we, we don't vaccinate people who've just recently endured a massive trauma. So if you have a major trauma and you ended up admitted to the ward or ICU, um, we will uh, avoid uh, during that acute injury or medical illness vaccination. But as soon as you've recovered, you're going to get vaccinated. Um, if people have had um, serious uh, allergic reactions, such as anaphylaxis, to one of the constituents of the uh, Pfizer mRNA vaccine or to its first dose, um, that is a consideration. Uh, the vast majority of even those patients can be treated in a medical facility by a doctor, um, uh, pre-treated and managed and safely um, vaccinated despite that. So the number of genuine medical exemptions is infinitesimally small. Um, although for four hundred dollars, I think you can go to any of a wide variety of quacks and get uh, an exemption um, emailed to you. Um, I guess for the record, need I say it? Those won't be um, accepted. Uh, there'll be a high level of genuine um, medical evidence to support it. Gary, this is a, one we discussed um, earlier today. Um, a question from uh, Melanie McKnight, and I can probably take a stab in the dark that she's from Levin Wadawiri because they patrol out of a caravan, which is the greatest surf club in, in New Zealand, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, hygiene areas, in terms of wiping down surfaces, hospital grade disinfected for, for patrolling areas like towers and caravans. This is fantastic. Um, I was recently um, offered uh, the services of a for-profit company that will go through and spray down areas and aerosol fog them with disinfectants. 
um, for commercial properties. This is what you could term hygiene theater. It's theatrics. There's no evidence base here. This is voodoo. This is where you you run away from from them. So uh, CDC many months ago um, said that something like less than 10% of cases are going to be spread through fomites, through surface contact, and the rest will be aerosol. And over time, doctors and scientists have looked at that and refined that number down to probably in the less than 1% um, range. So is there some risk for high uh, touch surfaces like cleaning off door handles and levers and, and things that are handled all the time? Certainly. Is there reason to um, clean your hands and disinfect them if you're going to be touching your face and doing things like that, eating? Absolutely. Is the risk major? No, it's minor. Um, do you need to wipe all services, surfaces with a hospital grade disinfectant or similar? COVID is a very weak virus. It's, it's fragile. Um, the studies that misled us at the beginning were talking about, oh, it can survive four days on this surface and, and three days on that one. And they weren't clinical studies. They were looking for intact um, uh, RNA and not infectivity to humans. It, it was an absurd, it was like, a, I'm going to say bad science, but it was so basic as to be erroneous uh, in its conclusions. And where you get COVID from, what I, what I want to impress upon you is hanging out in dense, poorly ventilated indoor spaces, usually for prolonged periods of time with others. And that is virtually all of your risk. And so if you want to fastidiously clean every surface in your house or, or deep clean or this or that, when you hear deep clean, you know that someone doesn't actually get it. They don't actually understand the risk of transmission of COVID um, and what that risk is. Um, so yeah, deep clean, or clean, wipe down whatever you want. I would say a reasonable and appropriate thing would be to have hand sanitizer liberally around the place for people to use and high touch surfaces like maybe keyboards and doorknobs would get uh, once or twice a day wiped down at the start of the day or at the end of the day something like that that's reasonable but let's not pretend that that is reducing anything more than a, a tiny tiny risk and um, masks vaccination and ventilation are where i want you to put 99 percent of your effort and then the rest, you know, the last 1% of your effort, yeah, that can go with wiping down things. Um, hospital grade, unnecessary. It doesn't need to be bleach. This is a fragile thing. And um, simple soap and water uh, washes of things are sufficient. Um, a year ago, we would have had, you know, strong recommendations about what needs to be this amount of bleach and, and, and all. But realistically, now we know um, that the aerosol um, is in the air. And that's what we're breathing in based on close um, proximity and rebreathing. Um, please publicize and confirm the exemption process for when or if it comes up. I think did, did we not just Adam's just answered that Good. through, yes. the, through the chat. Any, any advice for clubs on how to deal with compliance issues such as minimal persons in the tower? Oh, I'll leave that to Andy. He's the compliance expert. Oh, Chairs, do you want to just elaborate on that? What do you mean with compliance issues? I think he means if people say, screw you, we're having a party in here and I want six people in here and I don't care what you say. How do you get them to comply? Is that, is that right, Chess? Um, something on those lines, I guess, yeah. I mean, there's a big risk for those that sit on boards and, you know, the committees and stuff that essentially the clubs are following all the right protocols that they've set out. Um, I mean, just on the weekend, you know, like one club, seven people in the patrol tower, no masks, nothing. It was just like just like a normal day on patrol, really. Um, and we've had other clubs in the eastern region where, um, you know, they've come down to the club and found 20 people in the club rooms. Um, so I guess, is there just any advice on any tips or tricks? I think it's a good uh, opportunity to bring in Chris Emmett <laughs> to talk about... <laughs> uh, club uh, operational plans how they communicate it to clubs is there any good good advice from possibly what uh, we've seen in northern um or or any uh well 
put together club plans which deal with that stuff, especially around compliance. Um, and it may be a, a, a factor yet of, of you know, um, in Auckland, um, I know there's a lot of clubs who actually are limiting members who are, who are actually patrolling and, and some clubs aren't doing much patrolling at all because they are, um, they've set those rules in place. Around the rest of the country, I think that'll be an interesting um, role in the next you know, uh, month or so when everyone else starts patrolling through December is actually how, um, and if obviously the Auckland opens up um, later in, in, on the 15th, um, so if COVID does spread, maybe that, um, yeah, because there are, so, there are so many areas of New Zealand who haven't had um, COVID yet, so is it fatigue setting in or, or a relaxed state where, they, where they're where sort of ignoring um, basic health guidelines? Um, yeah, I think it'll be a, an interesting thing for us to watch, and that's why I think, again, the club um, operational plans are still a really, really key part of this and the communication between club committees to their members around how those plans are implemented. Oh, big, big topic, Andy. I could talk talk for ages on that one. Um, I guess our, our focus when we went through the alert, civil, alert level system was to try and really nail down as much um, operational best practices we could get around the clubhouses and around the spaces and Gary's always been giving us the advice that closed spaces, poorly ventilated spaces are the real risk for us. So we, we put a lot of effort into those plans. Um, there's been some good ones around the country and um, where, where clubs have had challenges, I've shared other good ones with them. Um, what we know through the, through the new government framework is that has loosened up a little bit around um, around the, that kind of detail about only having one exit, one entry, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess the plans moving forward would, I, I think they should really focus on keeping the club patrolling units going and really focus on ensuring that we are meeting what, it, what our core role is, I guess, to the New Zealand public is keeping your patrolling going and keeping that good. So. I, the options open to clubs around compliance. Um, I think they're a club by club option. Obviously, if it's paid guards, um, that could be an employment issue with us. So I would I would raise that with the regional uh, life saving managers and their and their teams around the country. If it's volunteers, then that comes into your club club judiciary process or how that club wants to be seen. So um, again reach out for assistance if you have some really difficult cases or, or what you consider is um, is something that needs looking at. Gary? Yes, Adam. There's, there's another one come up. Uh, it says, we talk a lot about getting vaccinated to prevent COVID. How about the story and detail about being vaccinated, but still avoiding contact and all of the bad things? Not sure I understand that completely. But I, I, I kind of get the idea. So COVID vaccination will reduce your chance of transmitting it to those around you significantly, let's say by 50 percent. I mean, the circumstance would vary, but um, in studies, it's been in that, the neighborhood of that. What about uh, the idea of getting vaccinated, but still avoiding contact and all of the bad things? So um, even with vaccination, it's not a superpower, right? It reduces your risk of some serious outcomes, hospitalization and death by 90 percent. But you, that's not 100%. You can still get sick with it. And so you will still employ ventilation um, techniques and doing things in open air and mask wearing by you and those around you and patients. Um, you'll do all of those things, whether you're vaccinated or not. We know vaccine wanes, right? After a couple of months, it's already just starting to drop. And by six months, it's markedly uh, decreased, uh, you know, very significantly. Um, and hence the third um, doses for vulnerable patients or boosters um, for the rest of us. And uh, yeah, you're still going to do all of those things. And this will be an evolving process. The, the kind of advice that I'm giving you will stand you in good stead, even if um, the next variant is is uh, more infectious, uh, which you know, again, we don't know details on it, but 
regardless, um, these are this is good advice for any respiratory infection. Um, avoid prolonged indoor close quarters contact to the extent you're able, and then utilize masks. Now, the thing people don't realize about masks, it doesn't just protect you from getting COVID in. It protects, uh, well, it prevents others from spreading COVID out. And so you will see, even among um, some medical health people, you'll see them pull their mask down when they want to talk. They, they think you can't hear them, so they'll pull their mask down. And you have to tell them that's exactly when you're spreading COVID. That's what spreads COVID. When you phonate, you sing, you hum, you cough, you talk, your vocal cords are coming together and air is being blasted through a tiny orifice. And it's the reverberations that allow us to speak. That process aerosolizes mucus and that's what spreads it. And that's why choirs um, uh, are so prominently focused in, in uh, uh, super spreader events because loud talking, coughing and singing are some of the worst things you can do. It also means that bars and nightclubs, loud environments where people are packed for hours, talking uh, loudly, closely, also the, the high risk locations, right? Churches, bars, nightclubs, parties, um, and social gatherings. Uh, those are the risk. Um, so yeah, I guess we could put that under the list of bad things to avoid. Um, or, or if not avoid, then it just risk, you know, mitigate the risk. Sorry, team. Paul says microphone not working. Fire questions through, and I will answer them. Paul, you may be able to call in on your phone, and uh, maybe the mic there would work better. I'm using a phone now. What can we say to our members around clinical studies to prove vaccination being so important? Um, it's a bit frustrating. I, I don't know that words or uh, logical arguments or evidence or proof uh, can motivate. Uh, will motivate everyone. I think there are some people who uh, can be told that the pan is hot and that if you touch it, you will be burned. But we know uh, that there are people who must touch the hot um, frying pan handle and get burned in order to understand that they could potentially be burned. Um, so I think there are some folks that will, uh, that will still be in an ICU um, uh, about to be intubated. I, I get these stories uh, in, in among medical things all the time. People about to be intubated, dying uh, in, abroad, um, saying, can I get vaccinated now? I've changed my mind or or regretting their, their poor decision. But um, and then there are ones who are, are dying and saying, I don't believe it was real. It's it's a it's a fake thing. And, you know, they, they go down kicking. Um, so what can we tell people about vaccination being important that hasn't already been said? Um, probably not much. Share this video with them. Share these discussions. Uh, they have to come to it on their own time and sort of decide for themselves. Um, I think more and more places need to just do the right thing for their patients and their staff and and uh, like like surf has to say, well, there's there's a preventable risk going to prevent it um, and and require uh, vaccination. And, you know, if people don't want to accept that, like, that's OK, too. There's a privilege that goes with rescuing someone with uh, helping them during the, the, the worst day of their life, um, uh, providing first aid or um, resuscitation. There's a privilege that goes along with that. It's not everyone in society that's that trusted to be allowed to have that role and do that. Um, and it comes with some uh, what I think pretty minor responsibilities to um, to reduce risk to colleagues and, and patients. Um, so I guess you can tell them that and, and see if that works. Um, when treating patients, is other PPE like gowns and face shields necessary? Great question. So pet peeve of mine, like I work at a place that requires gowns for certain interventions and the level of evidence is just so incredibly poor, unlike facts, masks, distancing or ventilation. Uh, the evidence for gowns is, is you know, is, is abysmal. Um, you don't get COVID through your skin and uh, gowns are probably another another one of those things that's a bit of hygiene theater. It feels like we're being safe, but it also comes with downsides of overheating and, and uh, huge amounts of PPE waste 
and um, inability to hear and move and do things. But um, that's just something that, that probably isn't very high yield. I think it might have been in some of the SAR stuff that we, the guidelines we wrote like a year ago. And I believe we've gone through and edited um, the gowns out. Face shields were an intervention a year ago when we were, um, the whole world was frightened at this thing that was just consuming uh, countries. And we thought that it was um, droplet uh, spread and, and, and also through surfaces and, and hand to face contact, which it can be, but it's uncommon. And when we now know that this is an aerosol problem and the face shields um, will keep a few of the bigger particles off of you, but they don't do a great job for preventing aerosolized um, spread. So face mask is where it's at. Um, a cloth face mask, not a single layer cloth. Those are fairly rubbish, um, but uh, two or more, two to three layer face uh, fabric face mask is a reasonable and comfortable thing that you can commonly wear. Uh, it's great, um, environmentally friendly and all, convenient, comfortable, but um, surgical masks are significantly, i.e. the blue ones with the little elastic bands that go behind your ears. I don't know if I have one on me or around me, but the blue ones, um, much more effective at actually stopping the, the uh, virus and preventing infection. And then in other settings, N95s, and you can even have hoods with uh, respirators attached to them. So you can go higher and higher. But um, a blue surgical mask is absolutely fantastic and, and very necessary. So we'll put gowns and face shields somewhere down here. And we'll put masks, vax, and ventilation somewhere at the tippy top. How do you deal with a patient who refuses to wear a mask? Hmm. Um, you can try to explain your rationale for, for why this is like, I'm trying to make uh, you safer for the people around to the people around you, to me, to everyone taking care of you. Um, and, you know, so we're asking you to put a mask on because it reduces your spread of COVID out really significantly. It's really, really effective at that. And I would remind people, and this maybe goes back to the other question, COVID can be spread by asymptomatic carriers. So, um, especially young people. So if you're 20 years old, there's probably a 40% chance that you will, you, that if you get infected, you will have COVID, but not even know you have it. You won't even notice. And yet during that time, you will be infectious mm -hmm. to others. This means that lifeguards are a risk to patients, um, in my opinion, at a significantly higher level than patients are a risk to lifeguards. That drowned patient has respiratory compromise by definition. If they get concurrently uh, infected with COVID from you, not knowing, you know, you're 20, you're healthy, but you give it to them, uh, they only learn it days down the line, then you have decreased their chance of a good outcome uh, markedly. Um, and that, that's the sort of thing that will cause unnecessary deaths and harm and lung injury and scarring and ICU stays and, and a certain number of deaths associated with it. So. That's what you want to do. Um, how do you deal with a person who refuses to wear a mask? Um, you know, with with delicacy, responsibility, and, and candor. I mean, you do the best you can. Um, that would probably be, if someone's refusing, um, I think they have to know that that sort of does, it does affect their care and their, you know, their risk to others. So absolutely, that would be someone that I would prefer to treat in the outdoor setting. Um, and I would try to have my intervention with them, my interaction with them be brief, limited, and, and then move away. And um, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know, that doesn't really answer your question, Melanie, but you do the best you can as you would with, with anything else. Um, even in an emergency department, I, I don't have the ability to force someone to wear a mask. Um, but they're also, in my case, the people that will end up going to a COVID ward or a high risk ward. And, uh, it, you know, they're going to be more likely to be around others with active infection. So ultimately, it's going to be an incredibly bad decision on their part. Do the SLS masks meet any standard? Um, there are standards for KN95 and N95 masks, which are used in, in hospital mostly in mm -hmm. higher risk areas. But... Um, there's many, uh, 
There's no standard for cloth masks, uh, certainly. And even among medical surgical masks, I think there isn't one agreed upon standard. So I think only the N95s um, and KN95s are going to be um, uh, medical standard um, things. So do they meet a standard? They're multi layers. Um, and that's probably the most important thing. Um, I, I would use one it's, if it's comfortable and you use it, it's going to significantly reduce it. How much? I don't know, 30, 40 percent, something in that neighborhood, maybe more. Um, but the key issue here is a mask that you don't want to wear uh, or don't wear has a zero percent um, effectiveness at stopping COVID. Um, so I don't, I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. You use your uh, masks and uh, the cloth masks that are provided by SURF um, uh, are adequate and uh, appropriate at this point in time, at least. Collection of vaccine status. Are there any privacy issues with club admins collecting and then forwarding to SLS and Z? And what safeguards do clubs need to meet to protect that medical record if admins are collecting within their club? I will leave procedural questions like that to the professionals, Andy and others. So um, <clears throat> hopefully everyone's aware of of the memo which went out from um, Paul Dalton around the COVID, uh, the, the vaccine implementation and how that's uploaded to, um, to the database. Um, yeah, if a, if a club admin is collecting information and sending it through to Surf Life Saving New Zealand, the member who was submitting that information is obviously willingly doing that to the um to the club ad admin obviously the club admin um needs to only share that information with its intended purpose which is to um surf life saving new zealand um and then obviously everyone who has access to the database um has uh, is under privacy or can't share that information um to to who it's not intended for um, I think there's there's a few more things to uh, around that. Um, how that we had a, a early discussion today, um, which uh, as part of our our COVID response um, group as staff, our, our, it's it would a, would a patrol captain have to um, have the the. The, the the scanner, I suppose, and everyone has to present their vaccine passport um, every time they um, attend patrol, or again through the club support uh, through the club um, operational plan. Should the clubs all understand that by the first of January, everyone on that patrol roster, the club ad admin would have access to to see who is vaccinated and who isn't, um, or who is more who is vaccinated, who has supplied that information. Um, because just because you your there is no um, uh, qualification or record against your name, that doesn't mean you're not vaccinated. It might just mean that you haven't um, supplied that information to the database. But how does club how do clubs manage that information? Do do um, club admins um, check the the uh, patrol roster to make sure people are? Um, or would a patrol captain have the scanner and scan your your vaccine passport as you get in? I think that's something which uh, which Paul is is currently working through around that advice. Um, it's obviously it's not mandated yet until the first of January, um, but hopefully the memo which went out to all uh, members shows the process to get that information up. And as Gary said earlier on to try and get that on information now. So we're not having a massive rush to try and get all the um, <laughs> vaccines uh, certificates processed by the surplus saving administration team on the 30th of December this year. Um, Tom, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, Adam might want to say more or Chris. Yeah, Andy, I can, I can give a quick update on that one. So um, essentially, most clubs in their constitution have a privacy clause around unauthorised sharing of information. So you'd want to hope that your administrator is a trustworthy person and not, not sharing that information. First of all, we set up 
we set up a process of capturing vaccination status for our staff only, um, which is paid lifeguards, beachhead instructors, and SAR members or who are not staff but are volunteers. Um, we did that through the administration um, email address. We are also happy to work with clubs that want to send them in bulk to us, but there are requirements around what we sent. You can't just send the pass that you get as the piece of paper in. You have to actually take a screenshot of your proper vaccination with dates. That is the information that we are required to have by law on file against any person's name. The other part of that was with vaccination status of lifeguards being quite important, we also wanted to have a system that we could use um, for our entry system for events into the summer. So we're trying to future-proof the system we have had. And we've also had some conversations around um, whether it comes into the patrol app or not at some stage that Northern Region currently working with that might be rolled out to the rest of the country in the future. So um, we, we would say currently that the privacy is covered but we just um, and we've had legal advice around that and they agree with us um, but yeah really need to work with the clubs about how to get things loaded up just in terms of how much time it takes a member to get loaded um, the ladies can turn them around in the office and there's a um, couple of them that mainly do them in about two minutes flat so there's no Currently, there's no big backlog of vaccination status waiting to be processed. I think Gary might have explained it earlier. Um, we've got a question, a quick question there, Gary, around sanitising uh, junior surf training, lifeguard tubes, um, hosing down or sanitising? Is sanitising important or is the good old hose, surf club hose, um, good enough? I think a, a surf club hose down and uh, an air dry is more than enough. Um, if it's medical equipment we're talking about or sort of, let's say, patient contact stuff in a first aid room, um, you can use whatever disinfectant you want. Um, but frankly, just uh, soap and water cleansing and dry is fully appropriate and sufficient. Um, for outdoor gear, uh, I would just um, hose it off and let it dry and uh, you're, you're set. Um, it's worth mentioning things like mannequins. Uh, Andy and I have had extensive discussions about, you know, whether you, um, <clears throat> what's the best way of managing that sort of risk. And uh, certainly uh, we're gonna do what other uh, places around the world have been doing, and that's to um, pretend to give breaths um, and not require people to uh, do mouth to mannequin contact. Um, despite that, that's a setting where I would still say, you know, great hygiene is is um, is necessary um, in case there are people who are, you know, using face shields or whatever on the mannequin. But yeah, cool. All right. Hey, um, as on uh, Friday, um, certain areas across the country do move into um, uh, traffic light red. Um, so I thought. Um, James Lee is on the call, the operations manager for Surf Life Saving Northern, and uh, he, um, James, could you just share some, any learnings you've had, obviously, um, um, Northern Region, North, Auckland in particular, have, have been patrolling um, during Alert Level 3, and from when you started to to now, has there been any real massive learnings which um, which you've seen either from a from a lifeguarding point of view or even the 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 public awareness of of um, what's going on at the beach when they should be physically distancing but probably haven't been. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I guess I guess from the start it was it was quite a concern for the clubs. And then we worked through their safety plans with them, um, worked with SLSNZ around the um, NSOPs to give a little bit more clarity with the resources that you that you had online, but just compiling it into one. So that was really good. That gave them a little bit more clarity and reassurance around what we're doing. And then, of course, um, the government exemption around operating um, 
as a, as a life saving service. So that was that was good. We got going, and then from there, um, we had all the safety plans through. We sort of co created those safety plans. Um, and got to a really nice point with those. Yes, with the new framework coming in, those safety plans will just need updating to sort of complement that um, that new framework. But I, I guess some of the key learnings that I've seen and clubs have experienced is probably the timing. This is the big one, is probably the timing of everyone arriving at the club in the morning. And that seems to be the situation where you know if there's IRB training going on, RWC training going on, junior surf arriving, a lot of people are arriving at the club at the same time, so really working on staggering um, that arrival time, so you don't have too many people around the club, and of course people arrive at the club and need to go to the bathroom or something like that, so they go into that indoor environment. So that's probably the key bit of learning there is that staggered arrival at the club, and really thinking about your core purpose first as a life-saving club is to provide those those active um, patrols out on the beach and everything else can sort of fall around that within that within that timing but a lot of the clubs have gone back to that core purpose hey let's get patrols set up first once patrols out of the door um, and on the beach then other activities can start to take place but very staggered um, so we keep that like Gary's keeps going on about um, which is really good and it's been really good for me is just being outside as much as we can and trying to limit that indoor um, confinement of, of being around each other. Um, and then the other the other thing is, um, especially when the weather's been so nice, so it's been easy to be, out, be outside, um, but when it is a little bit windier, when it's a bit rainier, um, is really limiting that amount of people around the tower or that, again, that indoor environment. So you see people sort of coming back towards that tower or that um, or that shelter. And then as a club, you've got to weigh up, well, how many people do we need around the tower um, and looking at where our resources need to be. Um, so clubs have sort of gone through those phases and, and working it out. And I guess at the start, even though we had our government exemption to operate as, as, um, as much as we needed, I just kept it tight with the clubs and, and said, let's work with a number of 10, no more than 10 to start with. And then they could work out where those 10 lifeguards would go. Um, so we kept it tight. And now as the beaches are really starting to become quite busy up here, um, some clubs have just scaled it up slightly from the 10, but they're still operating in a fairly tight patrol. Um, so I guess that's, that's some of the learning there. Um, and then, you know, just having the leaders, a lot of clubs just had the leaders or the seniors operating first, the more experienced operating first within the club. Um, and sort of setting that benchmark and those expectations of what they want to see throughout patrols. And now some clubs are just starting to open it up to more members coming in and um, lifeguarding. But yeah, I think things are things are going OK. Um, we've just had PLS start um, today. This has been the first day of um, all of the West Coast stretch for the Auckland region opening up um, and popped out to a couple of today and, you know, it was really good to see that they, they were outside, they were distancing, they were wearing their masks where they could um, and putting all those basic measures into place. So we're getting there slowly but surely. Thanks, James. Yeah, no, I really think it's, it's um, really good advice. I think, again, those, those club operational plans, which which um, we keep reiterating are, uh, are so important and that, uh, yeah, it's something I hadn't thought of too, especially on a, on a Sunday, I suppose, where, where um, junior surf and, and training and stuff might be occurring as well, it's how we um, clubs mitigate that because uh, we've got basically um, Eastern Bay of Plenty and, and Gizzy and are all uh, right down to... Uh, Whanganui will be the probably the clubs which are affected. I don't think it stretches down as far as Himatangi. Um, yeah, so I think probably something to keep in mind for those. But also, you know, the, there might be areas, um, who knows, especially after Christmas and New Year, which might go from orange up, back up to red. But um, only time will tell. Um, one more question, Gary, uh, from Jack Doyle um, on... Uh, viral filters for bag valve masks. 
These are fantastic questions. Um, viral filters would have gone into the recommended equipment um, or the equipment recommendations uh, almost a year ago. Um, and I would recommend, and they should now exist in, in a few different uh, checklists and whatnot, but I would um, strongly encourage people to put viral filters as a routine on all of their bag, valve, mask, um, exhaust limbs. Um, it's easy, it's cheap, they're just like a few bucks, and they uh, decrease the amount of stuff you're spewing out. Um, keeping things in perspective, that's not where your risk is. So there's beautiful studies in um, mm -hmm. anesthetics now that look at the intubating uh, procedure and they measured aerosols in real life, real practice. And what they found was that the amount of aerosols produced by the patient simply coughing was vastly in excess. I mean, orders of magnitude, like add zeros onto things um, than what occurred with the intubating um, procedure. So it's not the highest risk, most important thing you'll do in your day, um, but getting viral filters is just part of good patient management, in my opinion, these days and going forward forever. It's a small addition onto every bag valve mask that renders it more safe, especially if you're gonna be in a, a confined space, an ambulance, a first aid room, um, it just makes sense to, to have that. So. I would hope that all of our clubs know how to access that and uh, and can buy it. Um, I know there are New Zealand suppliers for it. Some I, the name is slipping me. Whether it's Pharmaco or one of the others. Uh, by the way, I have no conflicts of interest with any of this stuff. I don't have any uh, financial relationships with anybody um, uh, commercially. Um, and yeah, so get your get your viral filters. Have them be part of every bag valve mask when you sort of get them, stick them on so that they're not one thing you have to think about and it's ready to go. Oh, and speaking of that, Andy, um, I hate outing you like this, but um, you know, we've spent a lot of time, effort and work on coming up with a good, rational, reasonable equipment list and gear list. It's not ready for uh, I guess, full dissemination. There's many, many steps and logistics to it, but I think it would be reasonable that early adopters, clubs that want to have a, an, a list of equipment um, that has been vetted by me and by the medical advisory group, uh, if they want that list, Andy, is that something that they could like ask you for and get, or is it something that's um, unavailable to them? No, we can, we can put, it's been through the rigor enough and it was just more, that we're trying to get to a position with this is this is a little bit off topic but but why not um to a point where we're where to buy the stuff to some recommended suppliers and all that sort of next level after we say this is the type of stuff you need um because it would be a follow-up question of where do we get it from and, and i don't necessarily have those answers um i'm just being guided by gary and his um and his medical cronies, which are, are doing a great job. So I think we, we can start to disseminate that out now. Um, it's a lot better than you know, the old, uh, and with the NSOPs, we can start to really drive that because the old POM just used to say, here's a list of stuff. Um, so that's where we want to get to, to a, to a point where, where the you know, um, viral filters on, on bag valve masks become standard, um, and this is who we will get them from. So yeah, that's... Um, been a work in progress, but you can get it out um, this week. And it's it's a very particular, uh, detailed, specific list. It's not just this AED or that LMA or whatever. It's literally this model, this size, this type, in this number, um, so that we're all working off the same uh, playbook. We've all got the same gear and it's standard. I'm not saying every decision on that list is gonna be the absolute perfection, but it's the best we could reasonably come up with um, over many months. And, uh, and we can always refine it in the future. But I think for clubs that are interested in standardization and um, safety, uh, it would be uh, probably something that they would like to have because um, it make, might make life easier for you. Um, so you don't forget about things like viral filters. It's all on the list, this pack, We'll have this gear, so hopefully that helps. 
Cool. Um, Fiona from Waihe Beach has just come through. Could we source a preferred supplier? That's where we want to get to. At the moment, we don't. We need to to get to that point. We need um, consistency in product, which we have never had before. Um, so yeah, that's that's the, it's a long term goal for us all. Um, yeah, but there's no other chats coming through, and we've gone for about an hour and a half now. Um, unless Paul has sorted out his microphone issues and wants to jump in and say something. Um, or Adam or uh, Chris, Adam's back on to, to wind it up. Other than that, um, thanks very much from, from my point of view. If there's nothing else, it's uh, it's been really great for us um, to to listen and to, and to, to take these questions. I really enjoy this um, forum. Hopefully it's um, more face-to-face -face forums will be better um, being stuck in Auckland for four months, but that's what we get for being Aucklanders, all right? Exactly. We prefer you stayed in Auckland. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you to Andy and, uh, and Gary, especially Chris, for answering those questions. Um, a shout out to Lewis, who's uh, I know listening in. Um, Lewis, did you want to just say something about Wednesday and Thursday night so people are aware what your uh, phone ins with Uncle Lewis is all about? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Adam. Um, yeah, really, the um, Wednesday and Thursday are going to be uh, repeat sessions, so they're for um, related to specifically to sport and junior surf. And um, what's going to happen is in, within the next kind of 24 to 32 hours, um, we'll be sending out information to clubs uh, around our kind of interpretation, contextualisation of the Sport New Zealand and government um, advice and how that looks for junior surf and sport and that will hopefully give clubs uh, a day or two to digest that and um, and come with any questions and then at those uh, sessions we'll effectively be walking through each of each of the pieces of advice um, and I've already received um, over over a dozen questions via email already so um, yeah if you've got people who are involved in your clubs who are Director of Junior Surf, Director of Sport, or the equivalent, regardless of the name, um, feel free to um, to get them to uh, to to jump on and, and engage. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Lewis. Um, yeah, just my uh, just a closing statement already, um, which is a thank you, and it's a thank you to everybody who's dialed in, and and to pass on a thank you to everybody who's doing the hard work at the clubs. Um, we as staff are constantly in awe um, of the voluntary work that you guys do and girls do. Um, it's staggering um, <clears throat> and the beaches are busier than usual. Uh, some of the stuff that uh, people are having to do, the SAR teams, um, West Coast Auckland teams are extraordinary at the moment. So thank you and uh, keep going. We'll keep supporting you. Um, and if you do have any questions that you uh, think of later on tonight, um or tomorrow then please just email email paul at the covid.support at surf life saving email address and he will make sure you get an answer uh, and that email address will go on the covid uh, web page our covid web page tomorrow morning all right thank you very much